We welcome you to Emmanuel Baptist Church, and we welcome all folks who are here in person, and we welcome the folks who are also uh, watching us online live, or maybe if they're seeing this at some other time, uh, but you're welcome here, and we are pleased that you are able to be with us this morning. And uh, it says our practice here at Emmanuel Baptist Church, we like to ask questions to engage all in the conversation of faith. So uh, when we have those questions here, whether we're in, in the sermon here part, in the service, in the sanctuary, you can raise your hand and, and uh, we'll get your input on those. And those folks who are watching online or seeing this online, well, then you guys can add comments and questions there likewise. And as we open our message time this morning, I'd like us to think about Lenten fasting. Fasting during Lent. So here's the question that I have for you. So raise your hand and if you have an input on this question is, what is the point of Lent and what is the point of fasting? Does anybody have any ideas what the point of Lent may be and what is the point of fasting, particularly during Lent? Okay, giving something up for Lent. Yep, that's, that's certainly part of it. Yep, we certainly know that that's the common practice that's often made in Lent. Yeah? One of the things that I've seen on Facebook is denying self. Okay, the denying of self is an important concept during Lent. That's true. Good, we're going to build on all of these things. Any other ideas? What is the point of Lent and what is the point of fasting in Lent? Any other ideas? Why do we do this? Mr. Ben. Okay, purity and maybe some cleansing element involved there. Okay. Okay, we're thinking you're building on the, the gift concept where since Jesus, you know, God gave Jesus our son, his son for us, that we were supposed to give something up. Okay, that's an idea. Yeah. Bringing us closer to God. The question of why and how would be an interesting thing for us to consider. Ah. Okay, so we're thinking that concept of fasting is that if I'm not sitting down having an hour and a half long buffet meal, <laughs> all right? All right, I know that might disappoint many of us, right? Uh, that gives us an extra hour and a half time that we could spend in prayer and contemplation and Bible study. Yep, those are all true. These are all great points, and you folks are doing a wonderful job when we consider what uh, the observant of Lent is. Now, when we think most clearly and crisply about maybe denominational differences and what denominations really tightly follow that Lent, we would often think of the Catholic Church, wouldn't we? And, and, and it's also, and it would also likewise might make sense that whenever we have these ecclesiastical traditions that are closer tied to the Catholic Church, that they are more tied into that whole Lenten kind of concept as well. But during the 40 days of Lent, the Catholic Church has, holds fasts on the High Holy Days, particular ones, and they don't eat meat on Fridays. Now, these other denominations of churches that, are, that come from a tradition that's more closely tied to the Catholic Church, whether you're thinking of the Lutherans or Methodists or even indirectly Presbyterians, that's a different line, but that there are some similarities there, but not because of church tradition so much. Um, they do it in different ways. For the Lutherans and for the Methodists and the, sometimes the Presbyterians, uh, they look at it, it more of acts of abs, abstinence, where I'm going to give up something. And we have all been familiar with folks who would do that, right? That this says, you know, I really love Hershey's chocolate kisses. And that's my favorite treat. And I am going to give up cho chocolate kisses for Lent. Right? That could be an example of someone who's going to abstain from something so that they would participate in the Lenten activities. But why? 
How could fasting or this abstinence from certain foods be good for us? That's the question. Raise your hand and tell me what, that, what you think is why and how could this fasting or abstinence from particular foods during Lent be good for us? Okay, so if we're fasting and there's an opportunity for us to lose weight, right? there's a health piece. And there's actually some folks who are saying that that's actually healthy for people to, to skip, a day, skip a meals for a day for some folks. There's others who would not be good for them. But that, uh, that it could be good, yes. Right. So giving up something that you love and being able to do it for an extended period of time, say 40 days, shows that we have a greater endurance for maybe this, what we can do spiritually for God. All right, that pl plays a role as well. So yes, we, when we think about fasting or this abstinence from particular foods during Lent, it's intended to break us from our normal life routine and by calling us to refocus our relationship with God. And some folks even look at that as a form of, of, of um, charity or missions. They're saying, you know what, I love Starbucks coffee. Anybody here like Starbucks coffee? There's some folks that do, okay? How much does the large Starbucks coffee cost? Sorry, I don't want to pick on, on, on Starbucks, but it's a good example. A lot, maybe five, seven dollars. And let's say they drank one of those or two of those a day. And they said, all right, you know what? I'm going to give up Starbucks coffee. Starbucks is going to hate me. You know, or this one, right? Yeah, you're saying we're going to give up Starbucks coffee, and that fourteen dollars a day that I normally paid gave Starbucks, I'm going to set it aside. And I'm going to give it to a local soup kitchen or something. That's another method of ways that they would use it as a missions kind of function during the Lent. But I'm going to introduce something maybe a little silly, okay, to try to make a point. And when we think of this "what if" sort of silly. I'd like you to think that for the next 40 days of Lent, right, and it already started, so we're late, so you'd have to continue on past Easter if you want to get all your 40 days in for this one right now. I'd like you to think of a mixture of fasting and abstinence where you would only eat one meal a day, okay? And I'm seeing some eyebrows already. Wait until I get to the, the, to the punchline. The punchline being that this one meal a day is that you're only allowed to eat one hearty bowl of oatmeal for, 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 for 40 days and only allowed to drink water. Okay. Now, some folks aren't so concerned about that. And there's a couple of folks that says, well, you know, I might be okay with that. All right. For a lot of others, probably not so much. What, how hungry... Would you be for something other than oatmeal after 40 days of only having one hearty bowl of oatmeal every day? Do you think you might be hungry for something different? Okay, you can now play with me for a moment and tell me if you, after those 40 days are up, what would you want? All right, raise your hand up. Pizza is one that I heard. What else would you want? So one person says they still might want oatmeal. I, I, you know, I don't know that that would work, <laughs> but okay, go ahead. What do you? Steak. steak. All right. And this came from, uh, from, from one of our smaller guys in, the, in, the, in here, and I can imagine that he would want the big steak, right? The half a cow steak. Yes, yes. Cheeseburger sub. Burger sub. All right. Yes. Any other suggestions? After 40 days of oatmeal only diet, what would you want? Fettuccine. Yeah. Brandon would go for that one. Yes. Yeah, our son. Chicken or fish. Anything. Yeah. Someone might be smart and say anything but oatmeal. <laughs> right. So we could see how famished we would get. There's a lot of different foods and snacks we would really want here. So what does fasting, and in particular the 40 days of an oatmeal-only diet, have to do with our Bible study today? Well, in our Bible study, we have been studying the Beatitudes of Jesus. And we've been looking at the, that the Beatitudes are supposed to be the core hunger and thirsts of our soul and heart and spirit. And leading up to Easter, we have been working our way through the Beatitudes of Jesus to identify what B attitudes we need for true spiritual health and wealth. 
And today's message title is Be at the Beatitude of Hunger, Life, Right. Lifelong Getting, Guzzling, and Gushing, Jesus. And the first point we're going to look at this morning is primarily John, drawn from Matthew chapter 5, and particularly verse 5 today, is by blameless bounty. By blameless bounty. Now we have a supplemental te uh, text also of Isaiah 55, but we'll get to that in just a moment. And as a point of introduction, is that when we think about our series, we have been looking at the Beatitudes of Jesus and why, the, what I'm saying, the Beatitude study. Well, because in the Beatitudes of Jesus, he's giving us a framework of core, true, and critical Christian culture thinking. What does it mean to be a Christian is framed in these Beatitudes of Jesus. And so for us to really understand who we are as Christians and what a Christian life is to be, we have to understand the Beatitudes. And that's why we have been studying them. So when we look at the Beatitudes, there's a, there's a particular word, and I'll, I'll read verses uh, from chapter, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through uh, 6 today. I'm sorry, we are focusing primarily on 6, not 5. I misspoke a few moments ago. But there's a common theme, and I want us to look for what is the common word theme that we see in this passage. And when he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be Filled. So what theme do we see in all of this passage? There's one word in particular that just keeps coming up every time and again. What is it? Blessed. So we've now been thinking about that concept of what does it mean to be blessed? Well, to understand that, we have to understand the concept of the text. And we've talk, talked before in the previous weeks, particularly in detail, the first week of the study, that we're really, there's various ways one could look at this text and how to interpret the Beatitudes of Jesus. But, but I think, and we think, that the best way of, of putting this into context is that, the, is that there is a statement that's made in the Beatitude, first chunk of a Beatitude, and that blessing can be felt and experienced some in the here and here, but it is ultimately experienced in the hereafter. It's ultimately filled and experienced when Jesus returns and in the kingdom time frame. So it's, we call it a linked kind of view to think of that text. When we think of linked, these things are in the here and now, but when Jesus says, blessed are these promises being linked, they are already and not yet at the same time. When we also want to think about that concept of blessed, Therefore, and this is not like I created this concept or got it from my own head, but looking at various commentaries, one of the concepts that came from it is this blessing. We normally think of blessing in what ways? Isn't it something that happens that makes us feel good? How much money we have in our, in our pocket or in our checking account. We think of blessings sometimes in those contexts. But the blessing in this passage, and when Jesus says blessed, Someone remind me what it is. What's it about? It's being something. What's that? Being the favor of God. That's really quite, yeah, that's, that, that's the concept. Maybe not the exact words. Do you remember? Congratulated or commended. But all those, so the, the concept's the same that we're talking about here. Is that God is now going to commend. He's going to congratulate. He's going to put his favor upon us in the sense that because you have done such, my favor, my commendment, my commendation comes to you. You have done well, good and faithful servant. That's the concept of the blessing that we're really thinking about in this, in this passage, to be congratulated or commended. But so let's then think more about this particular beatitude itself. Let's look at verse 6. Blessed are those who, what? Hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. There's a lot of word picture pieces going on here that we're going to sort of break down and work through here this morning. 
So what did Jesus have in mind when he spoke of hungering and thirsting after righteousness? When we think of that, I'd like us to consider for an example... Um, Oh, just, this is similar to what we just looked at a few moments ago with our introduction. In various church traditions, we see Lent as a time of fasting as a godly example. And, and there are godly examples of fasting, in particular, 40 days of fasting in the Bible. Can anyone remember any person or persons who ended up fasting for 40 days? Anyone? Did I see your hand there? Was that Jesus, right? We can certainly remember Jesus fasting in the wilderness for 40 days where he, when he was tempted by Satan. Was he the first one and only one? Who else spent 40 days fasting? You have to go back to Old Testament. How about Moses? There may be more than these, and I just know these ones are the two that came to mind for me. Is that when the Israelites came out of Egypt, they crossed the Red Sea, and now they're out there at Mount Ararat, I believe it was. And now they had to go, and, and, a, and Moses had to go up, and he was going to get the Ten Commandments and the law from God. Guess how long he was up there? Forty days. So that th we see that same theme. That's why Lent is the way Lent is. It's built off of a biblical theme. Now pretend you did. Now let's change our, we did a pretend with a whole little oatmeal thing a little bit ago. But let's pretend that you did or could fast, and I, by this I mean eating no food, and only live on water for 40 days. So after 40 days, without food, how hungry would you be? Yeah, there's a spectrum that happens with, with hunger, right? You could be famished, and then after a while you could lose the ability for, to, to, if it goes too long. Yep, that's true. Let's pretend we don't hit that point. How much would you be thinking about food, or at least leading up to that point? You would be, we would, we would, be, we would be thinking about it constantly. The concept is, is that we would be famished, wouldn't we? We'd be completely and utterly famished beyond our ability to understand right now. This, I believe, is the concept that we're seeing in, with Jesus' words here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Blessed are those who are famished beyond words and thirsty beyond words for righteousness. That's the thought and concept that I believe that Jesus is using here in this passage. And this famished piece is again not drawn. Jesus is drawing from the words of the Old Testament as he uses his Beatitudes. And one of them that I think that he draws from in this particular sense is Isaiah chapter 55. So we're going to turn and we're going to take a look at Isaiah chapter 55. And we're going to look at verses 1 through the first part of 3. Why I'm breaking verse 3 in half is because it makes the point, you know, and we don't need to go on further to get there. So let's look at Isaiah chapter 55, verse 1 through the first part of verse 3. Come, everyone who is, what? Thirsty. Come to the water that you, uh, come, to, come to the water and you, we'll try again. Come, everyone who is thirsty, come to the water and you, without silver, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without silver and without cost. Why do you spend silver on what is not food and your wages on what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good, and you will enjoy the choices of foods. Pay attention and come to me. Listen so that you will live. Now when we see this particular passage, is Isaiah, or Jesus, because Jesus is working the same theme, speaking literally about food and literally about water. No. No. He's using the food and the water as an example where it really is pointing to the spiritual, isn't it? When we see everyone come who is thirsty. Now, is he just saying it's about physical thirst? Or is he talking about spiritual thirst? All of you who are spiritually thirsty, come to the water and 
You without silver, come, buy, and eat. Let's look at the first, uh, first one for a moment here and see the get gift given in this particular little chunk. We see that the image here of thirsty is an image of need and longing and brokenness and hurt and heartache. And the waters then are an image of who? Yeah, God, but most, more specifically, Jesus. That's who we're supposed to come to when we are broken and longing and needy and hurt and full of heartache. All those who have need and have seen their need. That's an important part when we look at this passage, isn't it? It's telling you, come everyone who thirsts. To come, you've got to acknowledge that you've got a thirst need, right? You have to admit the need first. Now, and how do we know even more specifically that this speaks of Jesus? Look, look at the second half of verse 1. Because there's some weirdness there. If you went down to the local mini-mart or to the local restaurant, and you were hungry and you were thirsty, could they provide you with something to give you to satisfy those needs? With one big condition. What's the one big condition? You have to be able to pay for it, right? If you walk in, I'm thirsty. You have something for me? Oh, yeah. I'm hungry. Yeah, we even have hot dogs. I mean, all right, all right. We have even at the mini mart. They have something there for you to eat. But you can't just go in and eat and walk out, right? That would be like theft. So while does this text make sense where it's saying, come everyone who is thirsty, come to, he could even say everyone who's hungry, even with you without silver, come and buy and eat. How can you come and buy and eat when you have no money? Because the price has already been paid. Because the debt has already been accomplished. Jesus is the one who already paid it. I'm the one who's paying the bill. You go in and get whatever you want, and I've got the tab. That's the message that Jesus is giving. Spiritual need, I have paid it. But when we look at this text as well, you know, let's look at what you also get to buy free. Well, let's pretend that for a moment. You ever seen those shows where maybe, and, and, and there's been times when a grocery store has, you know, the millionth customer comes through the door and they'll say, okay, the, the, the prize that you win for being the millionth customer to come through the door is that for, you get the next two and a half minutes to run through the store and put anything in the cart you want to and then you can come and you can get it free when you come back through. If you were to do that, what would you be filling your cart with in the grocery store? <laughs> Meat? What else would you be putting it in there? Crab legs. Crab legs. Right? 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 Lobster. Yeah? I know that the Darren Camps grocery store up the road over here has the reduced food lane. Right? And then you can get some good stuff cheap in there. Right? If, if you had that, would you be running down the reduced food lane and filling it up? No. You'd be filling it up with all the premium, luxury, expensive stuff. Right? You might not even like caviar, never tasted caviar, but I guarantee you there'd be caviar in that cart if you could find it. Right? Why? Because we want the luxury, don't we? Look at the text here. What Jesus is planning to give us, spiritually give us. Is he just going to meet, is he going to give us crackers and water? Because look at the text here. It says, come by what? Wine and milk, without silver and without cost. Now, unless you're Italian, okay, is, is wine a necessity of life or is it a luxury? It would be a luxury item. And in many parts of the world, is water a necessity, or excuse me, is milk a necessity or is it a luxury? It's a luxury. So these are luxury items that are now put on the list and that God is telling us, I'm going to give you the good stuff and you don't have to pay for it. Now let's look at verse 2. What is the purpose of an hourly wage? Let's think about that for a moment, please. When you go to work, you get paid X number of dollars an hour. What is the point of the hourly wage? What's going on there between you and the, and the, and the employer? Ms. Louise. 
Okay, to pay for what you work for. Okay, sure. You're being rewarded or you compensated, yeah, for the work that you accomplish. Yeah. What's going on in that exchange between the employee and the employer? There's an agreement. What kind of an agreement? Oh, okay. All right, good. Ms. Lynn? Yeah, you have specific tasks that you're supposed to accomplish, and, and often it can be done a certain number of them in a time frame. There's a quality expectation that's built in there as well. But let's think about this more at a rudimentary level. How many hours do we have in a, in a, a day? 24. How many weeks do we, how many days in a week? Yeah. And how many days in a month? Oh, it depends, right? <laughs> Yeah, 20, yeah, you're going to say 30, 31, sometimes 28, 27, depends what we're doing with February, right, right? How many days, minutes, and seconds do we have in our life? We don't know, but there's a finite number, aren't they? And aren't we doing when we go to work is that we're saying, I am now selling you a portion of my life for financial compensation. We are, aren't we? And it's particularly worse if you don't like your job, all right? It might be a happy sales transaction or it could be an unhappy sales transaction, but we are saying that I am now going to sell you part of my life for money. And what are then we going to do with the money? Let's look at the passage here and what, what, uh, what God tells us. Why do you spend silver, your life value, on what is not food? Now, is he talking about real food? No, he's talking about spiritual food, on subsistence and me, right? And your wages on what does not satisfy. Why spend your life on what doesn't really meet the need that you meet? Now, I'm not arguing here, and I don't think Jesus is arguing, and I'm, not, and I'm very sure Isaiah is not arguing that everybody's supposed to quit their jobs because you still have to pay your bills. But the point is, what is the life focus going to be? Where am I going to burn my life, and what value am I going to get for it? What will be the primary focus of my life? Energy. Will it be just for food? Just for what I get to drink? Or is it, will I pursue something deeper and more full and more filling and spiritual. Let's look at verse 3 and see what, what the outcome here is that we get out of this. It, it, actually, the second half of verse 2 and the beginning of verse 3. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. In other words, choose the best thing, me. That's what God's saying. And you will enjoy the cho choicest of life. It says food, but that's what it really means. Life, physical, and spiritual. Pay attention and come to me. Listen so that you will live. Wasn't this even the message of Jesus? Hear me. Follow me. Listen to me. We need to live long and get Jesus good. The second point we're going to look at this morning is swallow sustaining spring. Swallow sustaining spring. And I'd like you to turn to uh, John, the book of John. We're going to go to the New Testament. And we're going to go to John chapter 4, and we're going to begin at verse 11. But before we open that text, I have another question for you. And I'd like you to think about some times when Jesus was physically thirsty. Can you name some times when Jesus was physically thirsty? Can anyone think of one, Mr. Doug? Uh, okay, the Garden of Eden, not the Garden of Eden, oh my goodness, the Garden of Gethsemane. Yeah, I, you said it right, I was wrong. Yeah, he, was, he would be thirsty there, we see that, yeah. Okay, when he was going through Samaria, yep. Well, how about some other times when he was thirsty? Hanging on the cross, we know that, because he was thirsty and they, they, they held up the, the vinegar stuff for him, yeah, right. How else, when else was he thirsty? Yeah, the whole 40-day in the wilderness thing probably was pretty thirsty then as well. There are a number of occasions when we, think, when we can think of Jesus being physically thirsty, and this is one of them when you turn to John chapter 4. Because when we think of this, he was traveling from one point to another, and they chose to travel through Samaria, which most of the Jews chose not to do, because they wanted to stay out of the way of the Samaritans, but Jesus wanted 
to encounter the Samaritans. And while he was traveling through, he, the, the disciples needed to go into town and get some provisions. And Jesus hung out there on the edge of town near the well. And we remember this account well, I hope. And we're not going to read through that whole text. That's why I'm giving you the short story first to lay, to lay the context. And while he's there in the middle of the day, and it was literally the middle of the day, about noonish, a woman comes out, and he now engages that woman in a conversation. And he asks the woman to give him something to drink. And now we're going to jump in now into that conversation where we, at this point, as we look at verse 11. Because Jesus in verse 10 is telling her, if you knew the gift of God and who was saying this to you, give me something to drink, you would ask me for something to drink. So first Jesus asks her for something to drink, and she gives that whole Jew-Samaritan conversation piece. And now he tells her, but you know, you really should be asking me for something to drink. And now she's like, huh? And let's get to the huh part. Verse 11. Sir, said the woman, you don't even have a bucket. And as well as deep. So how are you going to give me this living water? Now, is, what kind of water does the Samaritan woman think Jesus is talking about here? The kind that goes in a bucket, right? What kind of water is Jesus really talking about? The water that comes, spiritual water that comes in us and that isn't contained in a bucket. This well is deep. So how, where are you going to get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us this well and drank from it himself and did his sons and livestock. Verse 13, Jesus said, Everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never thirst, get thirsty again. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of spring of water springing up in him for eternal life. So let's look at verse 11. With whom is Jesus talking and where do we find ourselves in this whole conversation? Well, we already sort of answered those questions, didn't we? We have Jesus communicating with the Samaritan woman and she now is posing that question. If, uh, uh, the, the question here in verse 11, it says, how can you even draw water? You don't even have a bucket. And where are you going to get this living water? The, the woman here is not following the spiritual nature of this conversation at all, is she? She was too rooted in her physical world, world. So we see a word of water there in verse 11. In verse 12, we now get to the greatness of the giver. So what is the root, though? In verse 12, what's the root of the woman's question? Is she trying to be snotty in, in 12? I don't know that she really is. Because it, it could be... Uh, the words themselves as written in my translation are, you, are, you aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? She's trying to figure out, who are you? Who are you? Is really the question that she is asking. If we were to put it maybe in a snotty sense, it would be, who do you think you are, right? That would be a snotty way of saying it. But I think what she's really asking is, who are you? that you could be saying these things, because this is Jacob's well. And, and, and how, uh, when you think about spiritual big dogs in the Old Testament, you, put, you would put Jacob on that list, wouldn't you? He was. He was one of the patriarchs of the Israel, Israelites. So she's asking that question. He claimed to be greater than Jacob, who dug this well so many centuries ago. Could you be that, that great? Faith only begins when we dare to consider how great Jesus could be. And Jesus made huge. Jesus made humongous. He made hubristic claims, didn't he? I am the Son of God. Jesus made huge claims. Some of those claims are is that I am the water of life. I am the bread of life. Without me, you cannot see the Father. But the first point of the question is, of faith is, who are you? And you have to consider the possibility that Jesus might actually be who he says he is. Let's look at verse 13. Physical focus fails. So what is the point of Jesus' reply here in verse 13 to the Samaritan woman? 
He's now telling her that I'm gonna, she's focused in the physical, but she's pondering something beyond her because she's now wondering, who are you? Could you actually be greater than Jacob who dug this well? And Jesus now is going to move her question into the spiritual world more clearly. Jesus says, everyone who drinks from this water will what? They'll thirst again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never thirst again. In fact, it's going to be a spring of life that bubbles up out of you for eternal life. Paraphrased by me there. So what is the point that you need to find greater you're going to die? When we think about water, how often do we need to drink water to stay alive or consume it? Because a lot of the water we get doesn't actually come in the liquid form, right? If we had a salad with lettuce, how much water's in there? Lots. We consume it in our food as well. So for us to stay alive, we need food and we need water. And how often do we need that water to stay alive? We need to consume it throughout the day, right? If we went a whole day and didn't consume any, any liquid, we could be sort of starting to get in trouble. It's, we need to constantly consume water to stay alive. And without it, we will die. If we live in a strictly physical life, we live in a hand-to-mouth consumption until our bodies give out and die. And then what happens to our soul? I think that's part of the message that Jesus is, is making here and presenting here. Let's look at verse 14. What does Jesus promise the Samaritan woman and promise us as well? But whoever drinks from the water that I give him will now what? Never get thirsty. In fact, the water that I will give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. Jesus offers to come and heal us of our hand and mouth physical existence. Jesus will take away the stain of our sin that takes us to the grave and ultimately to hell with it. All who come to Jesus will be made pure before God. We see the soul subsistence. There's satisfaction in this and there's subsistence in this as well. Jesus offered the Samaritan woman and offers us an eternal well of water that feeds us unto eternal life. And these words have an event of salvation and the process of sanctification in them. What do I see in this passage here with verse 13 and 14? Jesus has given us the whole picture of some really clear theology. You have to come to me and admit your need, and then you're saved. You're saved from hell, and you're now reserved for heaven when we come to Christ and say, I know I'm a broken, fallen sinner, and I'm saved. That event takes place. But are we done yet? No, there's that process of sanctification, the, the process of growing and becoming like and in the image of Christ throughout time. And we see that clearly through here, then that well that grows and bubbles up and out of us. And in the next passage we look at, we're going to see a little bit more clearly how that could be possible. So lifelong guzzling Jesus good. The third point we're going to look at this morning is flow, filling, flood. And we're likewise going to stay in John, but we're going to jump over to John chapter 7. John chapter 7, and we're, when we start reading in a moment, I have a question for you first though. We're going to look in verse 37. So let's consider dehydration for a moment. Since where thirst has been the key theme, even in Jesus' conversation with the Samaritan woman, water was the primary image that's there. We saw that imagery in Isaiah, likewise. We saw it in Jesus' Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. So let's consider dehydration for a moment. What are the symptoms? of dehydration. Raise your hand and tell me what a symptom of dehydration may be. Your body can start shutting down. That's a later stage symptom, but yes. Your, your skin shows that there isn't water there. I think it's become, we, we become less puffy, I guess, right? The skin becomes sort of, uh, I can't remember, I don't know what the legal, what the medical term for it is, but you can look at it in the skin, sure. Yes, Mr. Ben. Disorientation, that can certainly happen with dehydration. Any other kind of symptoms? You could feel faint. Yep, yep. yep same. Well, we had that one already. There's a lot of the various symptoms. Our skin can feel dry. We can get dizzy. What happens to our heart? Doesn't it start to beat faster? Our breathing would get faster. What happens to the eyes? 
They, because we're, everything is starting to shrivel, right? And, and think about our eyes, they're mostly fluid, right? So they're going to they get sunken there as well. How about our energy level? Have you ever been out working in the sun, maybe dog or others, out in the day all along, and, and you're feeling really bad, and you sit down and you, have a, you drink, drink some water, and next thing you know, what happens? You can perk right back up again. Your lack of energy, confusion, irritability, fainting are all those things, you know? We see all of those are various signs and symptoms of dehydration. And, but have you ever been dehydrated and didn't know it? Yeah, there's been times, right? I'm sure all of us have experienced that. Sometimes it gets us more in the cold weather because we're not really used to it. We've been outside for a long time. We didn't realize that, you know, we can get dehydrated there. Yes, well, dehydration can happen. So how important is it for us to drink enough fluids? Wouldn't it be important? And some folks are really saying, you know, you really need to be always drinking fluids. And some of them might be a little nutsy. But they're telling you, oh, you know, you have to drink 4.2 gallons of water every day. Maybe not that much. All right? But <laughs> and if you're on a diet, what are they going to tell you to do? What? Drink more liquids, right? All those, there's, drinking liquids is very important. And as a general truism, the more abundance of water we have and the more of it we drink, generally speaking, the more we abound in physical life. Now, you can overconsume in anything and even in water. But when we hear this, let's look at John chapter 7, verses uh, uh, 37 through 39. And let's hear about the abundance of spiritual water in this passage. On the last day, and the most important day of the festival, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, will have streams of living water flowing from deep within him. He said this about the Spirit. Those who believe in Jesus were going to receive the Spirit, for the Spirit had not been yet given, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. So let's pretend again that we're dehydrated. What is our first need then? It's pretty simple, isn't it? We have to get a drink of water, don't we? If we're dehydrated. So let's, I, we have to say, I need a drink. So let's look at verse 37 in here. The first step towards, towards, uh, towards uh, uh, spiritual, attacking the problem of spiritual dehydration, is that we have to acknowledge that I am thirsty. And isn't that what the first part of Jesus' statement is? If anyone is thirsty... Let him come to me and drink. The first step is, is that we have to admit that we have a need. We have to admit that we are in the middle of spiritual dehydration. And that if we don't admit that need, then nothing good is going to happen. If we have a physical dehydration and we fail to recognize it, what's the outcome? Let's pretend we are dehydrated. And now we've gotten to the stage where we're now gone into heat stroke or something. What is the physical out, ultimate physical outcome if not averted? We're going to die. And isn't that the same here with the spiritual point? If we don't admit that we are spiritually dehydrated, we will ultimately spiritually die. We have to come to Christ and admit our need. So what promise does Jesus make here in verse 37? We actually, he makes a couple of them, actually two, if I remember correctly. So what promises does he make here? as we look at verse, excuse me, 38. In verse 38, the one who, what? Believes in me, as the scripture has said. So we have to have belief. So pretend again that we're dehydrated. We're starting to now, we believe that we're dehydrated. That's the first important part, right? To solving the problem. But what if we don't believe that water is really the thing we need? What if we're saying, you know what, I don't really think water's going to cut it for me, you know? I think crackers. Crackers, that's it. That'll do it. What's the outcome going to be? Yeah, it's not going to go so well, isn't it? We have, if we're dehydrated, we have to acknowledge that we have a problem. First, then we have to believe that the water is actually able to do something good for us. And that's what Jesus is saying here. First, you have to believe that you're dehydrated, thirsty, and then you have to go where? Come to me. We could choose a whole lot of other different options, couldn't we? Yeah, spiritually speaking, you know what? I, I know my life's a mess and I got problems, but I just got to work harder at it and everything will be better. Right? 
Or maybe, you know what, I tried that, it didn't work so well. I know that there's a bookstore somewhere around here at the mall, and I know there's a religion se section, so I'm just going to walk in there, pick up the first religion book I can get, and that'll solve it. Hmm? That might not do it so well either. You know, when I look at the television, they give me lots of answers. The commercials tell me an awful lot about how that I can have a better life. I, all I need to do is get a Lexus and wear Nike shoes and, uh, you know, maybe, you know, eat uh, the, the, the right food and everything will be wonderful, right? But that didn't solve the problem either. We could even be cynical and come back and say, you know what, there's nothing that's going to solve this problem. And I just give up. But what does Jesus say it is? First one, you have to admit the need, and then you have to believe in me. Now, there's a promise that's given here. What promise is here in verse 38? In verse 38, the one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, will have streams of living water flowing from deep within him, and I'll say her as well, to that person. He makes a promise that springs of life will lead, and it actually leads into the next point. And let's look at uh, verse 39 in this particular point. Let's look a little bit further as it goes on, because uh, so often when Jesus gives a parable, we might not get the answer. What's he really talking about? Well, John is, is playing commentary guy right now. Jesus spoke, and John is now given the commentary of what Jesus was just talking about. So that's helpful, right? for him to put the footnote in for us. He, Jesus, said these things, and he was talking about the what? The Spirit. Those who believe in Jesus were going to receive the Spirit. What Spirit? The Holy Spirit. And for the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not been yet glorified. But if we think of the timeline of faith, we have Jesus talking. Jesus hasn't died yet. So, after Jesus died, and then Jesus resurrected, and then after how many days? Forty days, right? He ascends, and now, later, short time later, at Pentecost, the Spirit comes. And now the Spirit is here. And we now know that when we believe, come to Jesus in belief, and we accept Him as our, our penance, as the one who has taken away our sin, that the Holy Spirit now comes in and dwells with Him. In us. I'd like us to consider the desert for a moment. We've been talking about dehydration, and if we were, ever, if we were in the desert, there would, could be a high risk of dehydration, right? If we're wandering around out in the middle of the desert, I mean desert, desert, not slightly green de desert, I mean desert, desert, how do you know where there's water? How could you, how could you, how would you know, what are some methods that we could use to find it? Mr. Birds or plant life? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Are the animals that live in the desert and survive in the desert, do you think they know where the water is? Yeah. So if you saw some tracks of some animal, right, you could follow that track, couldn't you? And maybe it would lead you to water. But after a while, are you going to need the tracks anymore? Wander around in the desert. You, maybe you find some tracks of something that looks like a deer or whatever, and you're, and, and you're following those tracks for a while. What's going to happen when you get close to the water? What are you going to see and what are you going to experience? <laughs> Mirage you might see, but that's not if you're heading towards the real water. You, yeah, that's not the happy ending story. Yeah? What's going to happen? In the middle of the desert, where there is a spring that pops up, what is always going to be around it? Yeah. We have now brown grayness everywhere where the sand is, but now where the water pops up, what's it going to be? It's going to be a green oasis, right? So wherever that water is, you're not just going to see it, because where the water is, life exists. Growth takes place. Abundance is present in all of those situations, aren't they? When we think about what Jesus is really trying to communicate here, is that the Spirit is, if we have Jesus in our heart and mind, and He now is living, the Spirit is now living and dwelling within us, what is the output going to be? 
in the desert of our life and the desert of the lives of those around us. Green goodness is going to be the outcome. We can't hide the presence of Christ in our heart and lives because it produces growth and life and abundance. It creates an oasis for those around us. So if there is no oasis, what does that mean then about our relationship with Jesus? Then we've not met him and his spirit is not in us. An oasis in the desert cannot be hidden because it produces life. The transformation from belief in Jesus has to change. It has to bring new spiritual growth in our lives. So what is the state of our spiritual soul? Have you come to believe in Jesus? And if so, there should be an oasis of spiritual growth that will be seen, that will be felt, and that will be a blessing to those all around us. Live long gushing, Jesus, good. We've looked at three points this morning in, uh, in uh, hunger and uh, hunger, life, right. First point one was buy blameless bounty. We saw this in Matthew and we saw this in Isaiah. But what are we going to spend our life on? Where are we going to put our life energies? Are we going to do it spiritually or just an utterly, completely physically? The second point we saw this morning is swallow, sustaining spring. Through the exchange with Jesus and the Samaritan woman, we see that there is an opportunity for us to have a new life and to be forgiven. And the third point we've seen is flow, filling, flood. And that when we come to faith in Christ, just like the Samaritan woman did, isn't there now going to be a gushing stream out of us? We're going to become that oasis of a person. So how have you heard God speaking and calling you today? So our folks are going to prepare to come forward and, and we're going to uh, be singing in just a little bit. There's a couple of questions I'd like for us to, all to consider. And we need to buy right and hanker for him alone. That's what I believe that we saw in our first point this morning. And, and do I seek solely Jesus? I need to swallow right and guzzle him alone. Am I sustaining solely on Jesus? And I have to flow right and gush him alone. Have I, has my soul been flooded with Jesus? All this comes back to one even greater another point. You've heard it from me before, and you'll probably hear it again. It really just rolls down into what have you done with Jesus, and are you part of the family of God? And what commitment is God seeking and calling and pulling you to make today? Well, we're supposed to come, and we're supposed to commit, and we're supposed to rejoice in the call of Christ in our life. Would you join me in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to open your word. We thank you for the power of your word. We thank you for the power of the imagery that you have given us, Lord Jesus. Heavenly Father, you, you've called to us and say, All who are hungry and thirsty, come to me. And I will give you rest. I will give you peace. I will give you abundance. We are called to subsist and exist completely in you. The first step of that is, is we have to acknowledge that I have a need. I know that I'm broken and fallen. And the second step is I have to go to the right source. I have to come to you, Lord Jesus, and say, you take me. You heal me. You make me whole. You fill me. Holy Spirit, make me yours. And then your spirit fills and flows in us. And as a result of that, we have an oasis of life in our life. An oasis that can be seen and felt and experienced. And if there is no oasis, spiritual oasis in our heart and mind and life, then we never met you and we never asked you in. That's where it sits and that's where it stands. Lord, if there's anyone here who has not given themselves to you, we'd say, Lord, Heavenly Father, I know... Lord Jesus, that I'm a sinner and that I have done evil things. And I know that you're pure and perfect and good. And Lord Jesus, I know that you died on the cross for me. Please forgive me. Give me your life. Make me a new person. And in that moment, we will know that we are in the process. We have been transformed. That moment of transformation has taken place. And the process of transformation will continue. And we will grow in peace in you. 
We thank you, Lord. And if anyone makes this choice and makes this decision, well, important choices and important decisions are not made in a vacuum. They have to be shared. You need to tell your pastor. You have to come tell me. You have to tell a friend or family member. You need to tell someone that you have come to faith in Christ. Because we are now learning to adopt the be attitudes of you, Lord Jesus. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Blessings and welcome as you join us to hear God's message for you from Emmanuel Baptist Church. If you would like to support our work, please feel free to contribute by using the PayPal donate button at www.ebc-etown.org. It is our prayer that this message touches, encourages, and challenges you in your walk with Christ. Thank you, Pastor Garrett.